As you're finding your place this morning, I would invite you to take out your Bibles and turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you don't have a Bible this morning, I would love to just uh, put up your hand. There are men going to make their way down the aisles. They've got extra Bibles. You can let them know that uh, you need a copy and you can follow along with us this morning. As we're studying the book of Ecclesiastes, you may have come to the conclusion that Lowell Smith, a commentator, came to you about this book. He said, there is no spiritual uplift embodied within these pages. Ecclesiastes accomplishes only one thing, confusion. That is the assessment of many who have studied this book. I hope it is not your assessment. As we continue our series and dig in this morning, I want to remind us of Solomon's claim. He says this in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What advantage does man have in all his work which he does under the sun? And Solomon here makes a claim that is universal, a totality statement about everything. But is such a serious, all-inclusive claim credible? Can someone really stand up and say something like this? I mean, what if someone came to you and said, there is no gold in China? And you would think, well, have you been there? Have you overturned every piece of dirt? Have you dug to the deepest parts of the earth in China? And now you're standing here. How do you know someone hasn't smuggled some in after you've left? What an audacious claim, there is no gold in China. I mean, would you trust someone who described the Grand Canyon to you based on the postcard that they bought at the Circle K in Mesa? Or would you trust a backyard astronomer who is describing the Milky Way galaxy after looking through a toilet paper tube from his backyard? I mean, how could we trust someone to say, everything is vanity, everything under the sun, all of it is worthless? I mean, if, if we could just see one thing that Solomon overlooked, is there one key that he missed? Is there one idea he didn't chase down? Maybe that would be the key to life. We need Snopes.com or some other fact-checking service to check up on this audacious claim. I mean, who can make these totality statements like this? Solomon's audacious claim requires authentication. And you might be here this morning at the front end of an experiment with something you think will bring you what you're looking for. Maybe you've just started down the road of some new relationship or some new experience, maybe a new drug, perhaps a new phase of life or the career you'd always hoped for, some new gizmo or the latest technology. Maybe you've just discovered a new hobby that has absorbed all of your attention. You think about it day and night, and you think, this is it. I finally found it. Maybe you're young, and the whole world is before you, and you haven't yet been disillusioned by the disappointments of life. They still hold attraction, the shiny metal wrapper. I want you to listen carefully to God's word this morning. There's a trap It's the trap of advertising. They never tell you everything at the front end. They tell you only what they think you need to hear to get you into this car today or whatever the product is. You see, trying to find meaning in life from an under-the-sun perspective is an endless exercise in futility. And what we're going to see this morning are the futile efforts of the most qualified, most invested, best financed human ever to play the game of life. And he was one who employed every resource at his disposal for the singular pursuit of finding meaning in this life. Let's read his words together this morning, beginning in verse 12 of Ecclesiastes 1. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I set my mind to seek and to explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, 
all is vanity and striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, Behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, and I realized that this also is striving after wind. Because in much wisdom there is much grief, and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we come this morning to these vexing words, eager to find what you have for us, eager to hear from you, even through the pen of Solomon, the king, the preacher. God, I pray that you would use these words by the power of your Holy Spirit to help us, to drive us towards an eternal perspective, to create in us a longing for heaven to get a right view of life under the sun. We ask for your help in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Intertwined in this passage are Solomon's credentials and his conclusions. For the sake of understanding them this morning, we're going to separate them out and look at them separately, one at a time. In order to authenticate his claim to answer the question, what is the meaning of life? Solomon puts forward his own credentials. In Ecclesiastes 1, 12 to 18, he tells us why he is a reliable resource for such a claim. And then he drives home his conclusion. We're going to look first this morning at Solomon's credentials. What is it that qualifies Solomon to make such an audacious claim about the quest for meaning in this life? Solomon's credentials are as follows. Number one, unlimited resources. Solomon was a man of unlimited resources. We see this in verse 12. He says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. He calls himself the preacher, that word koalet. Some people have just sort of used that as his title. It is the idea of gathering some for a message. It is assembling people to hear something. This is the word that Solomon himself uh, is described of in 1 Kings 8, verse 1, where Solomon the king assembled the people at the dedication of the temple. This is sermonic. In fact, Ecclesiastes uh, probably was heard in one sitting. And if you have the opportunity to read it in one sitting, I would encourage you to do that. And he says, I, the preacher, have been king. That is, up until now, as I presently am king, I have been king. And I think this is an indication that Solomon is writing Ecclesiastes near the end of his life, near the end of his reign. And he says, I have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. That is, he was king over the united monarchy when the northern tribes were united with the southern, with Jerusalem as the capital. This was the high point in Israel's history. This was the the golden era of peace and prosperity. What did it mean for Solomon to be king over this nation at this time in history? It meant that he had everything at his disposal. It meant that he was the sovereign monarch over the ruling world power in his day. Now, I don't know that being king would be that attractive in very many eras of human history. In the long line of the history of kings in this world, that occupation has seldom been safe. You become the target of assassination, the uh, victim of corruption, and uh, everything else that goes along with being king. But Solomon experienced an unusual respite from his enemies, peace in the land, friendships and alliances with the nations that surrounded him. He had an unusual respite from the typical dangers of what it meant to be a king. And he had unlimited resources, which, as we will see later on, he employed in his quest to grab hold of life. Now, let's remind ourselves for just a little bit about the wealth, the kind of wealth that Solomon had at his disposal. In 1 Kings chapter 10, we have the record of the visit of another monarch, the Queen of Sheba. And she says this in verse 7 of 1 Kings 10. Nevertheless, I did not believe the reports until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. You exceed in wisdom and prosperity the report which I heard. Here is one monarch to another monarch. (laughs) 
You're more prosperous than I could have possibly imagined, than anybody could have described. In verse 14 of the same chapter, the weight of gold which came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. That is some 25 tons of gold given to him in gifts from other regencies around the world, aside from all the merchants, aside from all the trade and the taxation that were part of being king. 25 tons of gold a year in gifts alone. Verse 23 of 1 Kings 10, So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. One king greater than all the kings of the earth in riches. In verse 27, the king made silver as common as stones in Jerusalem. There was nothing Solomon couldn't have. There was nothing that Solomon couldn't purchase. There was nothing that he could not acquire for himself. Can you imagine what it would be like to have the world at your disposal, to do with it what you like, in order to find out, is there meaning to be found in life under the sun? Solomon's credential begins with unlimited resource. The second credential he describes is in verse 13, and Solomon had what we might call dogged determination. Dogged determination. He says, and I set my mind to seek and to explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. The words wise and wisdom and know and knowledge occur some 23 times in this section, which ends in chapter 2, verse 26. It is the highest concentration of wisdom words in all of the Bible. And Solomon is employing all of his vast resources of intelligence and wisdom to go after this question. He says, I set my heart, literally, English versions say, I set my mind. The idea here is the the whole inner person, the Hebrew word heart, uh, describes the command and control center. It is all that a person is, and Solomon committed his entire self to this task. He was not just some sideline academic in pursuit in the margins of his kingly career. No, he set the whole course of his life, all of his resources, all of his faculties, all of his gifts and abilities to this task. He was determined to discover what life, what everything was all about. He says, I set my heart to seek and to explore. These two words here are near synonyms. To seek is to penetrate deeply into something. And to explore is to look broadly across something. It was a word used to describe spying out a land or a territory. Solomon, in one sense, goes to the depth and the breadth of everything there is. And he says in verse 13, I have sought to do this by wisdom by wisdom. In other words, Solomon's pursuit of meaning in life under the sun is an intelligent pursuit. I'm not saying that Solomon was as smart as he should have been or that he was adhering to a biblical definition of wisdom that he himself defined. But as far as it comes to knowledge under the sun, he was going to use his surpassing intellect intellect, to go after every bit of knowledge and wisdom available under the sun to answer the question. And he says he wanted to seek out and explore all that has been done under heaven. He wanted to know everything about everything. And he set set his whole self to this task. A third qualification or credential that Solomon lays out is his exhaustive inquiry in verse 14. He actually did what he set out to do. He said he set his whole heart to this task. And then he sums it up by saying, and I did it. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun. The exploration of all that is available to a man of unlimited wealth, unchecked power, and superior intellect. And he says all of this has been done under the sun. Again, this horizontal perspective that Solomon is pursuing. Solomon's scientific exploits here are not vertically oriented. He is exhausting what can be assessed in this life. And he's employing his great gifts of observation, assimilation of data, and experimentation. He's using all of these gifts for Solomon. For Solomon, all of life from botany to architecture to music to sensual pleasure has become a laboratory, a great playground for an incomparable intellect and unending resources. He could ask every question and follow every conclusion to its end by investigation, by experience. He knew everything that was available to him to be known. 
Listen to 1 Kings 4, 33. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that grows on the wall. He spoke also of animals and birds and creeping things and fish. It was said when he talked with the queen of Sheba that he answered all of her difficult questions. He truly was the most interesting man in the world. You couldn't have a hobby or a specialization that Solomon didn't know more about than you. You know, if you walked up to Solomon and said, you know, I'm writing my doctoral dissertation on the feeding habits and reproductive cycles of Adriatic sturgeon, Solomon would reply, yes, I find it fascinating that they don't begin to reproduce until they're 15 to 20 years of age. I've written the definitive work on the subject. His expertise extended to every human endeavor. You could not out Solomon Solomon in the quest for knowledge. This leads us to a fourth credential under Solomon's belt. Unprecedented genius. Verse 16, unprecedented genius. I said to myself, behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me. My mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. These sound like self-absorbed, arrogant, boasting words. (laughs) I said to myself, I've magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me. See, Solomon was wise to begin with. We know that because when God came and said, whatever you'd like to have, he said, I want wisdom. He was wise enough to ask for wisdom. That's a great starting point. And then God gave gave him wisdom, 1 Kings 3. But here, Solomon claims that he magnified himself and increased wisdom. That is, he used his intelligence to grow his knowledge. He knew how to know, and he pursued knowledge with vigor. And he says, my knowledge exceeded all those who were over Jerusalem before me. Let's count all the kings of Israel and Jerusalem before Solomon. David? Well, there's only one. Is it? What does Solomon mean here? Uh, he doesn't just mean Israel's kings. But every predecessor... You see, Israel was not the first group of people in the land, and there were many kings in Jerusalem over groups of people there. The Jebusites predated the Israelites. In fact, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, is mentioned in Joshua 10.3. There were a whole host of numerous other rulers in this city. And actually, Solomon's claim here is quite a modest claim. He's not boasting. (laughs) He's speaking actual fact. In fact, Solomon understates the reality You see, he wasn't just smarter than any king who had ever sat and ruled over Jerusalem. He was smarter than every man in all the surrounding nations in his day. Listen to 1 Kings 4. Now God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind like the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. Then Ethan, the Ezrahite, and Heman, and Calchol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was known in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees, etc. People came from all over to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. And in 1 Kings 10, 23 and 24, so King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in wisdom. And all the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom which God had put in his heart. Even more than these statements, listen to God's promise to Solomon in 1 Kings 3. Behold, God says, I have done according to your words, Solomon. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. In other words... God declares that Solomon would be the smartest man to ever live. Have you heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, morons, Shakespeare, Pythagoras, Da Vinci, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, Nikola Tesla, Stephen Hawking, Bobby Fischer? I know you've heard of Ung Young. He's a Korean civil engineer whose IQ was recorded by the Guinness Book of World Records when he was very young. By the time he was three years old, he spoke and read four languages. 
And when he took an IQ test at the age of four, he scored over 200. That's a lot. The world has its lists of the smartest people who ever lived. But God already told Solomon that he would be the smartest of them all. Listen to God's greatest all-time declarations. Don't you love these in the Bible? Who was the humblest that ever lived? Moses, right? Who was the greatest? Not Muhammad Ali. No, it, John the Baptist, right? Jesus said of him. And who was the smartest? Solomon. And he says, my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And Solomon's not a man to use the word wealth lightly. A man who stocks the cupboards of his getaway cabin with gold dishes. A man who makes silver in the land like gravel. The one who received his gifts every year, 25 tons of gold from surrounding nations. A man like that does not use the word wealth to describe inconsequential amounts of anything. And he says, his mind has observed a wealth of wisdom. And knowledge. There's a fifth credential laid out in this passage for us, and it is Solomon's thorough investigation. Thorough investigation in verse 17. And I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And again, here he literally says, I set my heart to these things. Madness and folly are close synonyms. If there's any difference between the two, the first is something more incoherent, just madness. You don't know exactly what you're doing, but it's crazy. And, and folly is more rebellious. And in fact, later in Ecclesiastes, the same word for folly is used for immorality. In other words, when Solomon says he studied wisdom and madness and folly... He meant that he was going to leave no stone unturned. He was intelligently going to look at folly. He was wisely, not fear of the Lord wise, but another kind of wisdom we'll talk about. He was going to pursue madness. Solomon wanted all the wisdom that could be gained by a thorough investigation of the opposite of wisdom and knowledge. And so he would look under the rock of foolishness as well, just to see what he could see. He's like the incurably curious explorer who wants to know what the inside of a volcano looks like. He wants to see the irradiological effects of a nuclear disaster firsthand. With his white lab coat on, he struts into the storage vault for infectious diseases, sniffing the contents of every vial just so he can learn what's in there. Did you notice the eyes in this passage? Verse 12, I, the preacher. Verse 13, I set my mind. Verse 14, I have seen all the works. Verse 16, I said to myself, behold, I have magnified more than all who are before me. Verse 17, I set my mind. I realized. There's a lot of I in this passage. Solomon isn't talking about wisdom and and knowledge here in terms of revelation, in terms of what God has disclosed for men to know. He he is not expressing a dependent epistemology, right? How do we know what we know? Oh, I need to know what I know from God. He is using God's gifts, the wisdom and knowledge, the great intellect that God had given him, and he's multiplying it for himself himself. Why did Solomon request wisdom? Do you remember? He said, I'm young and and I don't know what I'm doing. I need wisdom so I can rule your people well, God, and so that I can discern between right and wrong. That's not what he's doing here. Solomon here is satisfying a selfish desire for intellectual inquiry. It's a selfish pursuit of the satisfaction of his own curiosity. And what we see in Solomon's life is remarkable giftedness married to moral and theological compromise. And what a tragedy Solomon's life is. To be given such rich gifts and to turn them inward to serve self. Charles Bridges put it this way, instead of a fruitfulness of a long course of devotedness, all with sorrow and shame, with only a few last rays of the setting sun to brighten the thick cloud. Solomon's life is a life of squandered potential. 
And yet, by God's grace, we have the record of Solomon's rear view look at what a disaster his approach to life was, what a wreck he had made of the experiment. And we get to say, I don't have to do what Solomon did. He explored everything I'm tempted to look at. He, his credentials stand. He, he can make this totality statement. I can believe him. His claim is credible. In fact, no one else could qualify for such a quest. And what is it that Solomon discovered in this great enterprise? Let's look at Solomon's conclusion. This is the second part of our outline this morning. What did Solomon discover about the task of finding meaning in this life? And here we're going to look at four descriptions of the task of finding meaning under the sun. Verse 13. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. It's a big, heavy, sorrowful, disappointing conclusion. This idea of a grievous task, this is what some have translated bad business. It is a bad business that has been given to men. The, the word bad here is the word that sometimes is used of evil. It's calamity. It's uh, described of natural disasters and sicknesses and sometimes sin. Here it just carries the idea of grievous and bad and terrible. And the busyness, the, the thing we're to be active in. And I think Solomon primarily has wisdom in view here. The, the intellectual pursuit of the meaning of life. Philosophy. The quest for ultimate things for meaning in this life through human investigation. And he says, it is an unhappy task. Why is it so bad? Why, why is it so unhappy? Because it is a lifelong labor, frustrated labor, yielding no results. It's like doing a math problem your whole life and coming to the conclusion that there is no solution. It's so much hard work with no yield. And notice what he says about this grievous task. This is a grievous task, verse 13, which God has given. This is the first mention of God in the book of Ecclesiastes. And here, God's title is on display. As always in Ecclesiastes, it is Elohim, an emphasis on God as creator, as the one true universal God over all things. It's appropriate that Solomon uses this title for God in this book. Because what applies here does not just relate to God's special covenantal relationship with Israel, but applies to everybody. It's not as if Yahweh is the territorial deity of Israel and everybody else fends for themselves with their own gods. There is no other God. All other gods are idols, they're, they're, they're nothings, they're vanities in themselves, and the one true God is creator over all. And Solomon says, God has given this task to man. This burdensome task is God's doing. And because it is God's doing, you and I cannot remove ourselves from it. Being frustrated by our under-the-sun existence, being stymied in our pursuit of ultimate satisfaction in this life, it is inescapable. It is our unavoidable job description on this earth, and it is given to be so by our Maker. And Solomon says, this is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men. We talked about this last week. The same phrase is at play here. Solomon literally says, the sons of the man, ha-adam. In Hebrew, it's the Adam. Solomon is making an explicit reference to the fall. We are all descendants of the one who rebelled against God in the garden. To refer to us as the sons of the Adam, the sons of the man, is, is to relate us to the fall and that first rebellion. This phrase, the sons of the man, occurs 11 times in the Old Testament. Most of them are Ecclesiastes. A similar phrase, sons of men, plural, occurs 139 times in the Old Testament and has more the meaning of humanity. Right? We shouldn't read humanity here in verse 13. We should read sons of Adam, sons of the fall, 
sons under the curse, sons consigned to return to the dust from which they came. Now listen, the first use of this phrase, sons of the man, sons of Adam, occurs in Genesis chapter 11, verse 5. There we have the record after the Tower of Babel is built, right? This apex of human achievement and self-aggrandizement, this altar to human accomplishment. Everybody got together in their own wisdom and said, we'll build a way to the heavens. And the irony is rich here in Genesis 11.5. Yahweh came down to see the city. He had to come down to see that big lofty city and the tower which the sons of the man had built sons of the man. What is God's declaration at this apex of human accomplishment? They're merely sons of the man. They're at it again. They're doing the thing that they are programmed in their own DNA to do ever since the fall, to rebel against God, to try to make a name for themselves that I will come down and squash. There's no mistake that Solomon is using that phrase here. See all of man's lofty accomplishments, but they are rebellious, cursed. They're squandering God's precious gifts and abilities on a futility that will amount to nothing. Solomon views our earthly existence here something like the second installment of a trilogy. If you have a a trilogy of three books or or three movies, Uh, if we were to break up history into a trilogy, it would be pre-fall, post-fall, and eternity. And you and I live and breathe and play and work. We investigate, philosophize, ponder, and seek east of Eden in a condition of fallenness and sinfulness and innate rebellion against God and against our very purpose for existence. We live in a world corrupted by our own fallenness, in a world cursed by God. We live post-fall. We live in the second installment. Genesis 3, God told the man, cursed is the ground because of you. In Romans 8, 20, Paul picks up this same idea. He says, the creation was subjected to futility. The same word that that translates hevel, uh, that futile, empty, vanity word from the Old Testament. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of God who subjected it. The endless and fruitless task of hunting for meaning under the sun is bad business for humanity, primarily because we were built for something that transcends this life. And we'll get there in chapter 3. Embedded in every human heart is a longing for transcendent meaning, a satisfaction that goes above and beyond what is available here under the sun. That longing is in every human heart, and that longing haunts us. For those of us who have never looked higher than this life for ultimate reality, this life will be tireless frustration, promising satisfaction to the longings of the heart, but never able to produce Solomon, describing this task, says it is grievous. It is not just grievous, but secondly, it is futile. Verse 14, Solomon says, all is vanity and striving after wind. He says the same thing in verse 17. And again, he has here in view the intellectual or philosophical pursuit of meaning in this life. And he says it is vanity, that word hevel, the emptiness And he calls it a chasing after wind. I don't know if you've ever tried that. How are you supposed to catch the wind? You can't even see it. Ah, but you can see its effects. I know where it is. I tried an experiment this week. I grabbed a container out of the kitchen here at the the church building. I tried to catch the wind. I, I got out in the parking lot and I ran after it. And I thought, you know, I can be smarter than this. I'm just going to stand here and turn into the wind and let the wind come into the container. And I closed the lid on the container. I took it inside. I showed Allie. Got the wind. What did I discover? The the wind had stopped being windy. (laughs) Inside that container, it wasn't moving around anymore. I I hadn't caught anything. As soon as I had caught it, it, it wasn't wind anymore. Solomon tells us that the pursuit of meaning under the sun is like chasing the wind. 
striving after the wind. And some translations would have this shepherding the wind, trying to get the wind to conform to what you want it to do. It can't be done. If the exploration of all that is available to a man of unlimited wealth, unchecked power, and incomparable intellect could yield no results, if Solomon couldn't get it, why in the world would I think that I could find the meaning of life under the sun? You and I ought to take the philosophical shortcut. (laughs) Trust Solomon, the most qualified man ever to make this assessment. To steal an illustration from my brother-in-law, He said, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack, except it's not a haystack, it's a hay planet, and there's no needle. You spend all your time looking through it and never find what you're looking for. There's a third description, it's in verse 15. This task of finding meaning in life is not just grievous and futile, it is also frustrated We get a proverb in verse 15. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. And Solomon turns to a a proverbial statement here to let us know that the game is rigged. The house wins. This is a clue to the vexation of life. I want you to look forward a couple of chapters to Ecclesiastes 7. Solomon picks up this same theme, but he's a little more explicit in verse 13. He says, consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what he has bent? Why is the world crooked? Who did that? God did. What if God wants the world to be crooked? In this trilogy of history, the the first installment was straight, Humanity was straight. God made man upright, but men have gone in search of many schemes. The last installment will be perfect, but this middle part of the story, volume two of the trilogy of God's plan, is bent out of shape. Everything is frustrated. Life is unyielding, and God wants it that way. God did this. You see, you and I were never meant to find ultimate satisfaction in finite things. In created things, we were built after God's likeness, and we were built to be in relationship to Him, to find our enjoyment in Him. In Eden and in eternity, the creation around humanity operates like it is supposed to. But God will not allow creation to yield the fruit of its design to rebellious humans who are bent on squeezing ultimate reality out of finite creations, worshiping the created thing rather than the Creator. So God frustrates our attempts. And listen, this is a good gift from him. What a tragedy it would be if God allowed us to find our ultimate satisfaction in trinkets that rust, that thieves break in and steal, or that moths eat. Human wisdom cannot unbend what God has bent. It's one of the ways that God makes foolish the wisdom of this world. All of the philosophers, and and they're often so certain that their own self-contradictory views were the correct read on the totality of human existence. They are all destroyed by this reality that God has bent the universe, and no worldview can get it. There is no neat, little, tidy perspective that can wrap it all up and explain it. Stephen Hawking has spent his life looking for such a thing in his work the brief history of time, he sums up his own quest to find the unifying principle of the universe. And here I quote Hawking, if we do discover a complete theory, do you hear that at the end of his life? If we do, it should be, it should in time be understandable and broad principle by everyone, not just a few scientists. Then we shall all, philosophers, scientists, and just ordinary people, be able to take part in the discussion of the question of why it is that we are and why the universe exists. If we find the answer to that, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we would know the mind of God. Do you hear his Tower of Babel? Now, he doesn't mean God like you and I mean God. He has deified his own philosophy, deified his own scientific endeavor. The human pride, this idea of human inquiry apart from God, 
In the same book, he says this, if the universe is really completely self-contained, having no boundary or edge, which is exactly what Stephen Hawking is arguing for in that book. He's trying to prove that. He's spent all his life and all his energies trying to prove that the universe is complete and whole and infinite in and of itself. He's trying to find a unifying principle to all of it. He said, if that were true, it would have neither beginning nor end. It would simply be, what place then for a creator? You see, he's assumed the very thing he's trying to approve. <laughs> and, and we think that he's smart. Hawking is no smarter than Solomon. And he was less determined. And he was less well equipped. And he is underfunded. And he will soon face the creator he has so long fought. He's already conceded the frustration programmed into the game. The world's best minds will never find what cannot be found under the sun. The answer to the riddle of life. Solomon gives another proverb in verse 15. What is lacking cannot be counted. What does he mean by what is lacking? I, I think he means here all the ways to go at life's meaning incorrectly. It's like going to Home Depot and purchasing not a how-to manual, but a how-to-not-to -to manual. Right? We could probably come up with a lot of ways how not to wire a house for electricity, how not to plumb a bathroom, how not to dispose of yard waste. There aren't enough shelves to hold the books that could be written about how not to do those things. I, I probably should have written a few of those. Small libraries would exist for every single person who has tried to find meaning apart from a right relationship to his creator. This is the futility of the philosophic pursuit. And intellectuals should know better than the rest of us Fundamental answers elude the under-the-sun investigator. And the more you chase the meaning of life under the sun, the more frustrated you will be. The philosophers are under the same curse as the escapists, the hedonists, the workaholics. This leads to a fourth description of the task. It is not only grievous and futile and frustrated, but it is painful. Look at verse 18. Because in much wisdom there is much grief, and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. For the thoughtful, more thinking results in increased exposure to the vexation of life. The information age is an endless ticker tape of discouragement. The more you investigate, the more you see, and the worse it is. The discerning of life's tragedies and disappointments is unsettlingly painful. See, if you turn over every stone, you might just find things you don't want to see. Things you didn't wish to know about. Arizona has scorpions. You may or may not have seen them. But if you buy one of those black lights at night and you turn it on, have you done that? And they light up. And you see them everywhere. I think I was happier not knowing that. You know, ignorance is bliss. I remember the first time I had a black light and saw a bunch of squirrels. I don't want to know that they're there. Maybe it's better to anesthetize yourself to the troubles of life. And many have done that. I told you I would quote musicians, our ponderers, our thinkers. How do we respond to the vexing problem of life? Maybe you pull a Bobby McFerrin. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry. Be happy. In every life, we have some trouble. But when you worry, you make a double. Don't worry. Be happy. Be happy now. Ooh, 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 ooh. Don't worry. Ooh, 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 ooh. Be happy. He says, ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry. Be happy. Joe Walsh's approach is a little bit different. He said, I have a mansion. Forget the price. Ain't never been there. They tell me it's nice. Okay, Bobby McFerrin didn't have a home. Joe Walsh has a house he's never seen, and it's a mansion. He says, my Maserati does 185. I lost my license. Now I don't drive. I have a limo. I ride in the back. I lock the doors in case I'm attacked. I can't complain, but sometimes I still do. Life's been good to me so far. He ends the song with, I keep on going. Guess I'll never know why. Life's been good to me so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And while some people give up and try to do the best they can, other people try to anesthetize themselves with pleasures and distractions, and they still don't know the answers. Maybe Switchfoot was onto something. Hoping he's bent, hoping he's meant for more than arguments and failed attempts to fly, we were meant to live for so much more. We lost ourselves. Maybe we've been living with our eyes half open. Maybe we're bent and broken, broken. We were meant to live for so much more. Have we lost ourselves? We want more than this world's got to offer. We want more than the wars of our fathers. And everything inside screams for second life. We were meant to live for so much more. We lost ourselves. We ought to listen to Solomon. Of course, there's one more credential that trumps all that we've talked about before. The Holy Spirit penned this book. God sovereignly ordained this book to be in our Bible so that we would learn from Solomon's mistakes, learn from his observations, And so we skip to the end, and I want to give you three endings this morning. The first one is the end of this section. It's in chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. Solomon concludes this section of all is vanity. Everything under the sun is a striving after wind. And he concludes it by saying this in verse 24. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. That sounds like Joe Walsh. He says, this also I have seen that it is the gift of the hand of God. There's the difference. It's a hint at the conclusion in chapter 12 that a right relationship to to your creator allows joy, real joy, real satisfaction found in him and experienced through the good gifts that God gives even in a broken and cursed world. Verse 25, for who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? Joy is accessible to those rightly related to their creator. Of course, in chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, Solomon tells us the conclusion, fear God, keep his commandments. This applies to every person. Judgment is coming. Remember that. Be rightly related to him. There's a day coming when he will set everything right, when volume three of the trilogy is in place. Solomon's credentials are legitimate. His conclusion stands. In fact, the culmination of all of human history to this point has only demonstrated that he was right. And the preacher is driving us somewhere to look up above the sun, to look heavenward. So there's a third conclusion we must run to. We must run to Jesus, the one who is smarter than the smartest man to ever live, the God-man, Jesus the Messiah. He himself said that when he was here, something greater than Solomon had come. 1 Corinthians 1.24 calls Jesus the wisdom of God. You and I are not just victims of a bent and broken world. We are perpetrators of rebellion from the heart against our creator. We are so by nature. And you and I can lament the brokenness around us, but we must repent of the corruption within us. You must be rightly related to your creator to have the answers to life and to experience the joy that God desires to give in this life. The only way that you and I are rightly related to our maker is because our maker came to the earth. The one who is outside of the universe, the one who holds the universe in his hands and sustains it with his very word, came into this broken and cursed universe so that he could take upon himself the corruptions, the sins, the crimes of anyone who would put their trust in him. And when Jesus bore our sins to that cross, he bore them before his Father, who crushed him in our place. We sang about it earlier. He was punished for our sins so that we could be free. You put your trust in him You trust the one that God sent. You trust the God-man, Jesus the Messiah. And he will make you free indeed. I'll take you back to Romans chapter 8. Paul tells us the creation was subjected to futility because of God who subjected it 
verse 21, in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. There is a freedom for those who belong to God, who are His children by faith and repentance. There is a freedom from the futility of life which has affected all of creation. And there's a day coming when all of the sons and daughters of God are set free, that creation itself will be set free. And stage three of God's great trilogy will begin. Eternity in his glorious presence for all who love him. The tragedy for those who seek to squeeze out of this life ultimate meaning is they will be ultimately disappointed. What awaits those who will not repent, who will not believe, who will not cast their lives on the one God sent, the Lord Jesus Christ, they will only experience an unending futility, unending anguish, separation from all that is good in God and the presence of all that is awful, terrifying. What a tragic end for those who live their lives in futile pursuits here to end in the anguish and futility of hell there. Let's pray. God, we would beg this morning that if there are those who are here who do not yet know you, who are still on the hamster wheel of life trying to chase meaning out of the things that can't possibly bring it, would you rescue them here this morning? And for all of us, oh God, set our hearts free from the temptation, from the trap of being allured by the shiny metal wrapper of things that are empty and void and meaningless in and of themselves. And let us Rejoice with joy at the gifts that you give and the enjoyment that you give along with those gifts for all who are rightly related to you. God, we thank you that we get to sing to you what a privilege it is to be in a right relationship with our maker. Thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who bled to purchase it for us. In his name we pray.